All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing time here at the conference so far. Next up, we have a panel titled How AI is Changing Threat Detection and Response. Please join me in welcoming our panelists to the virtual stage. All right, welcome everyone. We're so excited to have this amazing group here to discuss this topic with us. So first, let's kick it off by going around the virtual room and doing a quick round of introductions. So Ravi, would you like to kick us off? Hi, this is Ravi Mani, Chief Information Security Officer with Quest Diagnostics. Yeah, as part of my role, I manage security, risk, governance, and compliance for all of Quest Diagnostics. That's located uh, in the United States as well as globally. Happy to be part of this panel today. Happy to have you. Sahar. Oh, I believe you're on mute. Hi, everyone. I'm Saha. I am a lead of cybersecurity AI team and distinguished technologies at Royal Bank of Canada. Uh, I'm leading a team of data scientists, machine learning engineers, and data engineers to bring AI and big data analytics at RBC. And I'm really happy and excited about this time. Awesome. We're really happy to have you. Vital. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lital, and I'm Chief Marketing Officer and Security Evangelist at Hunters. Hunters is an open XDR, Extended Detection and Response. Uh, we help companies con connect all the telemetry they have in their environment and actively use it to detect attacks and provide information that it com provide complete view of what is going on in terms of cyber attacks. Very important work, thank you. And Charlie. Hi, Patrika. Hi, everyone. Really excited to be here. I'm Charlie Greenbacker, head of federal at Snorkel AI. Uh, Snorkel AI is a Palo Alto based startup spun out of the Stanford AI lab in 2019. Our enterprise software platform enables non technical subject matter experts to programmatically label massive amounts of machine learning training data in a matter of hours without requiring armies of outsourced labor, uh, labelers spending months painstakingly labeling data by hand. Uh, the result is a, a far more secure, scalable, iterative, and auditable approach to AI application development, uh, proven to be up to 45 times faster in commercial case studies, producing machine learning models with the same or better accuracy. Snorkel's technology is currently used by leading AI ML organizations like Google, Apple, Intel Corporation, as well as large enterprise customers across various industries and the federal government. Uh, we also support a wide variety of cyber use cases, including network traffic analysis for application fingerprinting, attack or anomaly detection, and policy enforcement. Thank you. Wow, excited to have you here. And Tim. Hello, I'm the head of security for JetBlue Airways. I've been here about, about a year and a half. And before that, uh, 15, well, 12 years, the head of uh, security for a company called Intersections Identity Guard Program. And then military and government service before that. Awesome, very excited to have you joining us today. So we've got some great, uh, great panelists here with some amazing perspectives to share. So I think we'll go ahead and get into our questions. So our first question is, there is a lot of hype around AI. How do you think about its utility in the cybersecurity function? So I know everyone's gonna have thoughts on this, but Tim, let's stick with you and kick it off. <laughs> Well, first off, you know, I, I do uh, translate or use a different acronym definition for AI. So I use augmented intelligence specifically because I had some prior experience and I wanted to stay away from the hype and focus in one, on the utility. So the utility for me and the way I look at it is specifically to overcome cognitive biases or human limitations that we have today. And so if we can do this to, to do things like react faster or to deal with large amounts of data that we're just unable to handle, these are the areas that I'm interested in and um, you know, obviously automation specifically. Very interesting. Charlie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely, tons of hype. Uh, I would say just like there was a lot of hype around the web uh, uh, in the mid nineties, right? Uh, uh, you know, Huge predictions on what the web would enable and how it was gonna transform society. 
uh, uh, those predictions, you know, perhaps took a lot longer than expected and, and didn't come out the same way that everyone thought. Uh, but I don't think anyone can, could argue that the, the web hasn't transformed uh, a society in, in big ways. And I think we're sort of in that same stage now with AI and machine learning. Uh, yes, way overhyped. Yes, tons of promises. Yes, a huge sort of, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, valley of death to cross where we go from those expectations to the realities of what it takes to operationalize this technology. Um, but, you know, just like we're seeing AI being baked into virtually every piece of, of modern software now in ways that we don't even really understand from the Gmail spam filter to the Netflix recommendation engine to ways saving you 15 minutes in traffic. Uh, we're going to see that sort of pervade across all verticals. You know, in, in cyber, it, it's really hard, you know, uh, to see these, these success stories. I think a lot of it comes from the availability of training data. In most domains, if you have someone that wants to develop skill sets or develop, you know, applications or capabilities, the first thing they go to is, you know, where can I get training data to sink my teeth into, understand this domain, try some things out. And you know, you'd be hard pressed to find lots of really you know, high quality label training data in the public domain for people to develop tools uh, uh, in cyber. It's not like companies are getting hacked and then releasing two years worth of network logs uh, uh, for researchers to, to play around with. That's just not gonna happen because it's either you know, way too uh, uh, sensitive, way too embarrassing, or they, there's just no compelling reason to do that. Uh, so I think in the cyber domain, you know, the, the, the lack of availability of training data, whether internal to an organization or external for researchers is one of the big reasons why we're not seeing this sort of, you know, breakthrough technology yet. Very interesting. Um, Lital, I'd love to get your perspective from a marketing side. Oh yeah, so I, I definitely agree with team, too much hype. And at the end of the day, it's about augmenting decision-making. So I think that uh, the anxiety around AI is that it's gonna eventually replace the SOC analyst, it will replace people. This is not gonna happen. I mean, we've seen it across the board in consumer apps that at the end of the day, it helps us save time and do the things that we as human beings are not so good in doing, like sifting through a lot of data um, and, and doing some things that the machine is just better than us. So at the end of the day in security, it will help um, eliminate a lot of silos. It will help cut the time for decision-making. The decision-making will be happen through human beings. So it is definitely an augmentation and not a replacement of our human work. Thank you. And Sahar, uh, from an academia perspective, are you agreeing or what do you think? Yeah. Um... I, I've seen both academia version and productionization version. In RVC, we took a different approach. We pair the data scientists with academic background, with the cybersecurity experts to bring AI and ML view, machine learning view uh, to cybersecurity. And yes, it's not going to replace such analysis. Yes, it's not going to replace any of the analysis or like human aspect, but like what AI going to do, and like we, we applied in an RBC and we see the results is to reduce the work of analysts and like help them to work on more interesting incidents rather than so many, lots of lots of incidents that not, that might be false positive or not interested. So uh, it helps them to decision faster. So we tell them, okay, these are, instead of like looking at everywhere, these five positions or these five computers are the most probable one, just go look at them, right? Or uh, these, these are the most uh, probable incidents, just go like, uh, or more important incidents, just go analyze them, uh, those incidents. So um, that's how we are bring, looking at AI, rather than like, oh, it's something, um, I was a magical going to replace everybody. No, it's going to help our analysis, it's going to help uh, SAC, it's going to identity access management teams, cyber operation teams to do their job better and be working on more meaningful events rather than lots of lots of data that might be bored them or uh, tired them. Definitely. I'm seeing a recurring theme here about, you know, what's augmented versus artificial intelligence. So very exciting to hear these perspectives. And Ravi, from a healthcare and life sciences uh, perspective, what are you seeing? Yeah, so I have to agree with that, um, you know, augmented intelligence. So I, I see that as a human-centered artificial intelligence, right? Uh, it's, it has to be 
human centric so what i mean by that is you know humans analyze through logic and reasoning so ai is a model basically and and for the most part it's unbiased even though i am part of a, a group that's uh, evaluating biases in ai if for the most part it's the algorithms and the models are unbiased and 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 it's used widely now as um, charlie was pointing out uh, especially in the healthcare industry where there is imaging um, you know physicians are overworked and and they have to uh, continuously read the images and there is a human aspect when you're tired you might miss something that's number one number two there are new um, you know ways to find uh, things uh, not not clearly from a human eye perspective so where ai comes into picture is by by means of ingesting a lot of data and 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 learning through machine learning processes ai will help reading images where it won't be missing the the, the things human will miss so that's where i think um, ai is going to provide most bang for the buck uh, per se, um, as one of the use cases. Excellent. And that's actually a great segue into our next question. Um, what sort of threats do you see having the greatest potential for AI to make a difference? And Ravi's already given us an example, but uh, I would love to start with Sahar on this. This is a great question. Um, so you can play, like AI can play a role in different areas of the cybersecurity from identity access management, cyber risk, third party uh, engagement, and even like the cyber events like phishing or like cyber attacks that leads to fraudulent activity. But in my opinion, one of the biggest things that uh, recently raised needs AI help is user entity behavior analytics, like insider threat. So especially in big, large companies, inside identifying insider threat needs lots of big data analytics, lots of uh, AI models, lots of behavior analytics models uh, to just, um, it's just because of the sheer number of events and data happening on those companies. Um, there are so many successful uh, results of application of AI in this field and so many need of it. You see in news every day at this point, like multiple times every day that insider trade risk raising becoming more and more important and AI can make it different. Like in, in next few years, you will see that AI in UVA analysis would be uh, one of the most important detection techniques we are going to use. Very interesting. Thank you. Ravi, are you seeing the same thing in healthcare or what do you see? Yeah, I, I agree with Sagar uh, where UEBA the, uh, is one of the areas for insider threat. But I, I let's go back and think about the business angle, right? We have collected tons and tons of data now. Data is the new oil. It's all unstructured. Social media is creating tons of data and it's all sitting there for us to consume. Uh, so, so with that, you know, the, the sort of threats uh, with, uh, with the amount of data, it's you know, humanly impossible as we discussed before. Uh, and in this particular case, SOC analysts, right? We have uh, skills shortages, first of all. And second of all, we are bringing in a lot of people and training them as a SOC analyst through the SME programs, uh, subject matter experts program. And, uh, and they have to manually create a graph to identify the attack surfaces that is correlated with each one of the nodes is, is not practical. So that's where the machine learning, deep learning, and AI combined will help us address these patterns and map it to a, a, a node graph or, or some kind of a thread graph and identify if the IP is originating from a foreign country, how is it connected to my network and where is it originating and where is it spreading, right? So that's one, um, one area. And the second area would be AI uh, improving the vulnerability management. We use CVS a scoring methodology, for example, to prioritize it. At the end of the day, the more nodes we have, the more vulnerabilities we will find. But how do we prioritize it by through the threat landscape? 
not just by scoring and prioritization by using a scale, that's, that's needed, but going above and beyond that to say, at this point in time, the tax are happening using RDP protocol that we, we know because there are tons of data that's coming through from intelligence saying the DDoS type of attack or a, you know RDP type of an attack is happening. So prioritize among the vulnerabilities, prioritize those using AI and address them efficiently, possibly in real time, will help us uh, secure our environment in real time. So uh, I'd like to add one thing to what Sahar said. And, and Sahar, you were dead on, right, with that specific area. You, you did limit it, though, to insider threat. But in actuality, there really is no such thing in a sense, right? It's outsiders, once they use an inside account, they become an inside threat. So exactly what you said, but expand it into all threat actors. So what we're trying to do is model behaviors of people who are actually trying to misuse internal accounts, applications, users. And so you need to be able to look at patterns over long periods of time. And so one of the things that we want to bypass are, you know, recency bias, you know, things that, you know, when, when our analysts are looking at it, they're not taking into account. And I think, you know, COVID through AI, especially pattern of uh, user behavior on its head because it all changed and we had to start over. So in a sense, we've got to integrate some of those behaviors prior to COVID along with what's happening right now. And that's very difficult for a human to do in large data sets. Very interesting perspective there and interesting to see how it changes across different uh, different verticals too. Uh, Lital, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think the most interesting thing would be, and, and that fits very well with the uh, team and Ravi's uh, um, ideas here, is to be able to put those uh, very um, uh, low fidelity signals that in every environment we have, when either an insider um, event happens or any one that compromises an insider um, to, to use it as uh, a way to get into the network. We've seen even with SolarWinds, uh, if, if we know how uh, uh, FireEye detected it on their network, it was because there was a low fidelity uh, threat through the authentication network uh, that they managed to spend a long time a lot of time and go and investigate what else was related to it. This is something that for most organization, because of either shortage of skill, um, not having the time to sift through so much data, it's so hard to see from all the amount of signals that they have. I think the most promising thing that AI can offer us is to put together those low fidelity um, signals and be able to amplify them in a way that we can see something that is becoming uh, a real threat other than SOC analysts sifting through, through so many alerts like they do today. Uh, I think this is most promising because at the end of the day, attacks are becoming still see more and more. It's hard to see them. They're using tools that we have in our environment. So to Charlie's point about training mo the model, it's hard because it's the, the attack surface uh, when the, it's, it's so vulnerable and everything seems the same, that the norm versus the attack tend to look very similar. Um, so we need to find ways of taking those minute signals and putting them together to form um, a real incident versus something that is not um, and it's just noise. Excellent point. Thank you. Uh, and I think actually that's a great segue. And I'd like to start with Charlie for this next question. Um, what barriers to AI adoption do cybersecurity organizations face? And we'd love to get your examples. Uh, Lital has already uh, alluded to some of them, but Charlie. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. A lot of examples already, right? So I think in, in cyber, you've got uh, with AI, the same challenges as every other domain, except in some ways they're worse, right? So the, the data sizes are catastrophically large, right? Compared, you know, look at something like uh, uh, YouTube, which stores every single application or user level event that has ever happened on the entire platform. Every click, every like, every watch, every comment, every everything versus, you know, who's out there storing, you know, in perpetuity, every single event that happens on a network. You just don't because it's too much data. 
uh, labeling that that data for you know training machine learning models requires absolutely deep subject matter expertise, right? Uh, most people can't look at raw NetFlow or PCAP data and say, oh, that's a policy violation, right? So you can't do like crowdsourcing, outsourcing, recapture uh, style uh, uh, labeling that just doesn't work. Uh, and like, you know, Tim and Lee Tall were, were sort of mentioning, the landscape is extremely dynamic, right? Everything is constantly changing. Every network is highly unique. Uh, uh, um, both the, the normal traffic patterns are constantly shifting as well as uh, the, the tactics of attackers. So many of the, the traditional approaches to building machine learning applications kind of break down in the cyber domain. Uh, that's one of the reasons why our customers that care about you know, network traffic analysis and, and cyber applications uh, work with us to create you know, training data in an extremely efficient way for their specific networks, their specific applications, their specific use cases, because one size fits all solutions just aren't going to work. And when, when things are constantly uh, changing, you know, like Tim mentioned COVID, that changed everything everywhere. How long would it take you, you know, once COVID hits to go and relabel enough data to update a model, right? So if you're doing anything in, in uh, AI and you're hand labeling training data, that's kind of going the, 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 the way of the horse and buggy, especially in cyber, that's never worked because of the, the reasons we've been talking about. And also tying this back to something that, that Ravi was mentioning about detecting and eliminating bias and the broader sort of uh, space of, of uh, trustworthiness and explainability, a lot of these traditional approaches, you know, when you have these additional requirements for explainability and trustworthiness and detecting and eliminating biases in enterprise settings and in government settings, a traditional hand labeled approach uh, uh, just doesn't work. Uh, uh, we've got ways where you could, it's trivial to, to trace the model output back through the entire process, back to what the, the subject matter expert has sort of designed the system to solve. Uh, uh, so a lot of these sort of barriers have been, been stymieing the advance of, of AI and machine learning and cyber for years, but I think we're starting to see some, some hints of, of daylight and green shoots. I love that optimism. That's very exciting. <laughs> Vital, what's your perspective here? Well, there are some barriers that start with, you know, expertise in place. The question is, uh, are you like a Sahas team that can afford having in-house uh, uh, AI team? Um, you know, all the way from the data science, data engineering part of it, which is tough, uh, uh, to the training models. Um, I, I think that just not enough expertise in place just for in the cybersecurity space for that. Um, so then comes vendors that provide some out of the box capabilities and um, that that will take time for uh, this to mature and, and for companies to go and adopt because not everyone can afford their own teams to go and develop their own capabilities in house, I think. That's an excellent point. Uh, Tim, what's your perspective here? You know, when you talk about barriers, the first two to come to mind are the ones that we create ourselves based on having too much trust, right? Or too much reliance or not really being able to identify the assumptions that we make, right? So if cases are, call, are kicked off and they're false positives and you're wasting a lot of time for investigations, people are just not going to use it. They're not gonna trust it. And they're not gonna worry about, you know, trying to diagnose what the real problem is. The other one is, uh, you know, if you get to the point of trying to make automated response and it starts shutting down operations, it's going to be a quick death to that feature of a product. I'm not going to say that it's all like that, but there are definitely mistakes that are made. But once you dig into it, sometimes you can find within the specific products implementations of ML that benefits you in ways that you would have never expected. And so there's bright spots. Wow, I'm loving this theme of optimism. That's making me feel hopeful. <laughs> Sahar, how are you feeling? So the barriers comes in twofold. Like first, like as uh, Charlie mentioned, it, like the label data is a problem, and also uh, we cannot uh, like rely on label data much because the uh, landscape changes so many times uh, that. Um, yeah, like landscape changes so so often so fast that label data within a month, within two months, like it's just like nothing, right? And it puts us in the bias, and we have to be very worried about it. Uh, there are lots of solutions from uh, data science AI point of view how to uh, overcome that problem, 
but uh, more or less we have to be very careful about how we use label data. If we don't use label data, we would have some false positive problem because there are so many anomalies. So, and then like we put lots of work on site, uh, site analysis or at, like analysis who is like getting those data. So this is some solution that like companies should be smart, should trust it. Like there's a business decision at some point. Should we decide AI team? Should we not decide the results? Like how we want to do it? Um, but then like there is a problem of data storage. Where data are going to be stored? Like um, there is a privacy issue in this, like privacy concern in different countries, in different area. Um, there's a ingestion concerns, like how we want to ingest them, how the models, we want to develop the models, explainability of the models. So like there are data science, big data problems, there are massive data. How to join those data is a problem, right? Uh, when you have a thousands and thousands, millions and millions of events, how to join them is a problem. The hardware is sometimes is not good enough to like, it's like to join all those data and events we have. So yeah, there are so many like there are both sides of the business problem and also like technical problems, but it's it's getting better. It's getting better and better with cloud, with uh, more uh, cyber, like more technology going to be more and more uh, handy with data, like big data, and then businesses and cybersecurity people becoming more and more aware of how data, how AI works. Like the same like people here, like five years ago, maybe people would think, oh, it's a magic, like we do, like every, like AI would solve all the problems. Now everybody averse is a hybrid. Human and AI going to work together uh, to have a better result. So with those understanding, we will go, we will have a few, like bright future in our uh, AI in cybersecurity area, I would say. Wow, I think this is the most hopeful cybersecurity panel I've ever heard. <laughs> Ravi, about uh, from healthcare, that's uh, that's a lot of data, a lot of challenges there. What are you seeing in terms of adoption? Yeah, not only a lot of data, these are regulated data, right? PHI data, PII data, and PCI data, all regulated, and uh, those are our crown jewels. We can, with the cyber warfare that's going on today, and it will continue for the foreseeable future, uh, AI is, is one of the vehicles that we, we are embracing to address those problems. But the question here is what are the barriers, right? Um, how do we overcome it? I see that in the three areas, I think several of the panelists touched on it. Uh, so it, this could be repetitive. The first one I see is the skills shortage, uh, coming back to the skills, whether it's AI or AI of our business on cybersecurity, uh, as Charlie pointed out, right? So the second one is building the ground truth. As we know there is tons of data available, building the ground truth from scratch and making it real. Uh, we always say in the AI field where the first AI model is like a baby that's born, right? It takes years, like two-year-old, five-year-old, and then maturity, right? And it takes years to train the model, uh, and, and the faster we train the model, there, there, there needs to be automation on training, right? So that's another barrier. We need to automate the training to identify any false positives. Uh, I think Tim mentioned about, uh, you know, sending in a automated a message to the end user or, or anything through AI bot and, and having that to stop the production is not a good thing. So training the model with less false positive is a barrier. It comes through skills and, and uh, usage of the patterns, et cetera, and we will overcome that. And the business acumen, right? Uh, we need to understand in a healthcare field, what is the business requirement? How are we addressing that? So we want to create the baseline using the security, privacy, and compliance um, uh, requirements, and then implement from a business perspective and move forward. Excellent, I love that. And uh, speaking of moving forward, that actually leads us into our next question. Uh, so do you anticipate AI changing the threat landscape over the next seven years? And I'm going to start this one off with Lital. Well, I think this have two sides for it. Uh, basically, on the threat actors part, 
they're starting to use machine learning and AI on their techs. They're learning our network vulnerabilities. They're applying all kinds of automated tools. So that's definitely, we, we're gonna see more automation used on the attack as we already see a lot of it from the network standpoint with bots, uh, we'll see a lot more sophistication coming. Um, so definitely on that side, I also think that we are seeing the adoptions on the industry. Um, so definitely it's going to change it. Uh, in what ways? I think we all discussed already um, the amount of data that each organization is creating every year is exponentially growing. And with that, I think that every five years, we completely rewriting the way we, we, we need to address um, this at scale. We've seen the pandemic creating new shift to the cloud, the amount of data that organization like Ravi's organization has just created with CREST diagnostics and their needs. So I, I think the need that organizations have for more automation will just rise and new technologies will emerge definitely in a scale of five to 10 years that we can just think how it's gonna be. We probably cannot anticipate where we're going, uh, but we, we all see how automation is reflected in any aspect of our lives. Um, this is not going away and this is only growing with the scale of growth of data. Very exciting. Tim, what's your perspective here? You know, specifically when you talk about like the threat landscape changing and how AI is gonna play into that. I mean, like like uh, Natalia said, you know, the the, are <laughs> the threat actors are actually going to use it. There's no doubt about that. But they might use it in ways that are not direct attacks, right? Because there's a there's a certain value from deception. And so I think that the attacks themselves are going to get much more complex. You know, what what's happening with one hand isn't necessarily happening with the other. And so there's going to be quite a bit of that that augments their ability and gives them kind of a force multiplier per se. So there's there's uh, there's that going on. There's also obviously a lot of skills that are increasing on both sides of the playing field. And those are the ones that we're most worried about, especially when you talk about being able to take something novel and rapidly turn it into automation. Uh, then we're talking about, you know, a simple, something that was learned and maybe something, Kasey is maybe an example of that, maybe something that was learned that was pre-packaged and then executed very quickly in a very short period of time to obviously gain a lot of compromises. Uh, and that's gonna be where, you know, I think where we're gonna to struggle to respond unless we do embrace automation ourselves. Interesting. Uh, Ravi, what are you thinking there? Yeah, sure. Uh, from a threat landscape, it's already changing. How is it going to change in the next five years? I believe the social engineering attacks are going to increase because many, many you know, uh, people are, are adopting it. The more people adopt it, the, the, that's where the attack is going to be. And uh, phishing attacks, we are seeing it today. It's going to grow beyond emails, right? There are ways to um, attack using uh, beyond emails through wishing and other, other areas. And then um, to my uh, area, uh, as well as other manufacturing units, IT versus OT. Uh, so far, we have been concentrating on the IT area. The gas pipeline attack is, a, is an example where everybody's eyes opened. A lot of things, right? Um, even our um, refrigerators or um, you know the, the doors all have OT component in it. And in my area, we are using testing machines that needs OT component. We need to, how do I um, isolate them and making sure uh, they, they all, those are separate, uh, separated and isolated using micro segmentation, et cetera. And then lastly about uh, with, with uh, privacy regulations coming in state by state now, and then implication on data centric security, right? That That is going to be a prime importance in the next five years. Excellent, excellent perspective. And Charlie, uh, what are you seeing? I'm hearing a lot about data, so I'm interested to get your perspective here. Yeah, it's funny, you know, a, a couple of minutes ago, Patricia, you're commenting on how optimistic everyone sounded, and now we're talking about the threat landscape and there goes all the optimism. 
uh, uh, like <laughs> it's an you know, endless Robin cycle. Talks about our, our refrigerators getting attacked, right? Uh, it, it's, it's nothing sacred, right? Uh, uh, I think, you know, like Latal and, and, and Tim said, uh, increasing use of, of, you know, AI ML based automation by attackers uh, with increasingly, increasingly more sophisticated capability than what we're used to. Um, automation has always been, uh, always been a tool used by attackers, whether we're talking about, you know, script kitties or more sophisticated, even state level adversaries. Uh, and, and, and I think what's interesting in cyber is that there's this asymmetry, right? There's this asymmetric situation where the defenders have to get it right every time just to tie, but the attackers only have to get lucky once in a while to win. Uh, um, so, you know, I think I'll, this is sort of shaping up to be almost an arms race where both sides are going to be increasingly relying on, on automation uh, powered by AI to achieve their aims. Wow, that's a great analogy. Uh, Sahar, what do you think about that? Um, I agree with almost everyone. Like AI is going to be used by uh, threat actors more and more. And like, it's just like, it's open source and they can use it. Uh, the only thing I want to add is uh, securing our AI models from the attack because it's going to have it's happening and it's going to happen more and more. These companies rely on AI to detect and protect their uh, information and their clients. Um, threat actors are going to focus on attacking those AI models more and more. And um, yeah, like when we are building the uh, models or we are like using a vendor out of box solution, uh, we should be very, very careful about that component that how attackers can attack them and how we can protect um, our models practically. That's excellent. And I think uh, I think we're ready for the last question here. So I'm going to let's let's move into this one. Um, how do you expect the relationship between human analysts and AI-driven machines to develop over the next seven years? Uh, so, Ravi, let's start with you on this one. I know we've touched on the topic. Yeah, so the, we, we, in conclusion, we, we all agreed that the attack surface is going to increase and the data is going to increase multifold and there is a skills shortage. Let's, uh, let's combine all those three, right? Uh, so that leads to some kind of an automation and some kind of a machine learning uh, implementation that is needed. So uh, th that's how uh, we are thinking to implement and, and, and more so from a, Sakhar mentioned about the NIST framework. Um, she, uh, I'm thinking identity, uh, identifying the problem and detecting the problem uh, areas should be invested more and, and concentrated more with, uh, with AI and human uh, models. Uh, because it's all about prevention. We have to be a step ahead of the, the bad actors. So it's all about investing money in the identity. At the same time, protect and respond, right? Um, uh, as Charlie mentioned, it's an asymmetric attack. And eventually the, we have to face an event. How do we, how resilient are we? How can we uh, respond very quickly through, uh, through our you know, uh, uh, CSERT plans, communication plans that are already in place and execute them in an event is, is, is the name of the game uh, on, on this uh, topic. Thank you for sharing. I heard somebody about to jump in. Who was that? <laughs> oh, that was me. I was just going to say, you know, you, you asked about the relationship, how it changes. You know, the way I look at ML today, it's like a, um, it's like an unproven intern. You know, it's not a prodigy at this point. And so with respect to that relationship, you know, if there's some, if it surfaces things that are valued valuable things that the analysts wouldn't see, then they're going to invest time with it. They're going to invest, uh, you know, more with respect to trust and actually helping to improve the process or maybe get the right data set or give it data that they never would have thought of. And so I think that that, that uh, relationship will evolve over time as long as, you know, there's, there's accuracy with which comes out of it. Excellent point. Uh, Sahar, what's your perspective here? Um. I, I think there, there is going to be a mind shift at some point. Like the, from rule-based solutions, this is a rule like 
black or unblack, bad or good, to a probability, to gray area, right? Because the AI never can, like, it might say in 10 years, I don't know, like the things changes, but at this point, we just like, as an AI model just can say, this is a pro, this, this event is probably bad, or this event is probably malicious, right? I can see the probability of score is 90% or 70% or 50%. And then that's, that's the role of analysts to learn and think, okay, this is not, oh, I'm going to block it. I see the event from AI models. I'm going to investigate it. It's the most probable like ones I'm going to investigate. And this mind shift from yes or no to being in the great fuzzy area, uh, it's happening and it's going to happen more, more and more because, and that's, that's reality because AI just can, like machine learning just can give you probability score, like nothing more. Uh, yes, like at some point we can say, okay, like the model prevents them, detects very well, anything above 70% probability, we are going to block it and looking at, block it right away and look at it later. But especially in cyber realm, like when we don't have a label data or we are on uh, anomaly detection realm, um, we have to rely on analysis and uh, human intervene to think about improbability area and uh, address uh, the events. No, that's an excellent perspective. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Charlie, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think like everyone was saying, right, you, you need to fight fire with fire and you need to fight automation with automation. Um, you know, humans alone can't operate at the same speed or scale as automated systems. And sort of like Tim was saying, this is where uh, the human machine teaming can help turn the tide. Uh, similarly, Sahar mentioned, you know, combining the, the raw speed and computing power of machines with the intuition, creativity, and, and higher order uh, reasoning skills of, of cybersecurity professionals. Uh, I think this is how you give the defenders a winning advantage or the, the, fo the force multiplier that Tim mentioned. And an, an analogy, I, I think, you know, where you were tying this all the way back to the first question about hype uh, uh, and, you know, how the web was overhyped, but still, you know, transform society, you know, in, in a similar respect, you know, all of the conversation around autonomous vehicles and self-driving cars is, is overhyped, right? And everyone's vision is looking at the time where they can, you know, fall asleep in the back seat with, you know, a DVD playing or something like, you know, obviously not DVDs anymore, but, you know, versus the reality of where we are, right? We're still, you know, quite a bit far away from, you know, sleeping in the back of our car while the car drives itself. But think about all of the, you know, uh, uh, very, very advanced driver safety, driver assist capabilities that have been coming online, you know, collision avoidance, right? Not necessarily taking control over from the driver, but helping the driver, right? If the driver, you know, God forbid, has a heart attack and passes out, you know, cars are able to get themselves off of the road and, and pull over by themselves without just, you know, careening into traffic. So I think in, in many different domains, including cyber, we'll see more of that, you know, augmented intelligence, human machine teaming, where you can combine the best of, of both worlds, the best of what the, the human analyst can deliver along with the best of what the automated system can deliver. Excellent, I love that. I love that analogy. That's, that's a great way of thinking about it. Vital. I think a lot of uh, the way we train and teach people on the job uh, will go towards working with the machine. Well, uh, the machine will improve in terms of explainability, like Sahar said, you know, what's the probability? What does it mean? Give a little bit more insight into the model. Um, I, I think a way of improving the human machine interaction and relation is to develop this ability of um, um, us human being to judge the model, to, to go and see the results that we're seeing. What does it mean? Uh, should we believe it or should we make our own um, decision? So I, I think we see it across the board everywhere. Like we need to uh, educate our kids about believing things they read on social media. Is it true or is it fake news? We'll see with deep fake, all of us need to grow up and, and be suspicious on what we see and, and put all the question marks. The same will happen across the board. Uh, we will kind of like retrain ourselves. I think the same as doctors that are now using robotics and machines instead of doing their own surgery the way it was done. Um, 
So a lot of the interaction between human beings and those models will be on us, the human beings, to learn how to better use the machines and the tools that we're getting out of the box. I love that, very interesting. And so we actually have about five minutes left. So I'm gonna throw one more question into the ring. Uh, the question is, what are you most excited about uh, in this field right now? What really, you know, what's the flying car? What's the thing that you're most excited about seeing? Uh, it could be big or small, but I wanna um, ask that to kind of bring us back into that optimistic uh, thing to end us out. <laughs> so uh, Sahar, let's start with you. Um. I love the field. So I moved from academic astrophysics background to this field like maybe five years ago, less than five years ago. And everything about this is still for me super exciting. Like AI going forward, like bringing so many new capabilities uh, and advances. And then we have cybersecurity, which is a challenge that non-stop challenge, like anything happens, COVID happens and the whole new uh, area of the challenge opens for like everybody in the cybersecurity era. A combination of them is just like field of innovation, lots of opportunities, lots of new things. And like it never gets dull, right? Because threat access always find new things and we have to uh, come up with the new thing. It's just like the, they change their techniques, we have to change their techniques. We change our techniques, they have to change their techniques. So yeah, like the whole combination of AI and cybersecurity, uh, I love it. It's just like never get dull. <laughs> I love that. Charlie. Yeah, I, I think for me, it's uh, uh, experimentation, right? So a lot of the things that we were talking about, all the, uh, all the barriers and the obstacles to building machine learning systems uh, uh, in cyber, uh, um, you know, I'm really excited about a lot of the work that, that we're doing across lots of different domains, sort of reducing the barrier to entry and making it easier for organizations to, you know, even experiment and see it, you know, will this dog hunt? Is there something, you know, there here? I've got an idea. I want to try something. If the, if the barrier to entry to quote unquote trying something as well, we've got to spend, you know, how many person months, right? Labeling some data just to figure out, is there anything worthwhile here? If you can reduce that down to, you know, days or even hours, you can get to a no a lot faster, right? And say, nope, we, you know, we've explored that. That seems like a dead end. Let me try something else. You know, uh, uh, similar things in, you know, in, in, in science, when you can reduce the amount of time to do experimentation, you can do a lot more experimentation and explore a space a lot further, you know, versus I think it was Sahar uh, uh, that mentioned, you know, astrophysics, like often, you know, they, they measure experiments in decades, right? Only to get a negative result and say, nope, uh, uh, that won't lead to a warp drive. Let's try a different direction, right? If you can reduce that to a, you know orders of magnitude faster, right? Like getting negative results can help steer you back towards a, a more positive direction. Love that, Lital. Yeah, I think that there is a great potential in increasing job satisfaction and happiness in people working in security. I think not a lot of us talk about it, but um, cybersecurity is a stressful industry to work it. And now uh, we, we all been hearing about, you know, the difficulties, especially through the pandemic, you know, it, it's, it's hard. If we could have taken some of the mundane, stressful day-to-day -day work and give tools that people can trust that will take um, and increase the resilience and give them tools that um, can help them go through um, the, the tough part of the job and get some more, um, get them focused on things that really matter. Because I think everybody in cybersecurity uh, into treating real incidents, in helping the organization, in helping the business move forward and saying more yes instead of no. I think we'll do a lot. So I, I'm hoping automation and, and AI and machine learning can help a lot in that area. That's excellent. Ravi. Yeah, as a, as a technology innovator, I like three areas. One is continuous innovation. Life is not boring. You know, you, you get challenges by the day and you try to solve it, right? So so that's challenging and you cannot get that in uh, in many other fields that I can think of. Uh, this is a good uh, area to be in for continuous innovation. And secondly, 
I moved into the healthcare field, and and it's uh, it's very very rewarding in the last 18 months seeing, you know, how we enabled testing uh, to all the people around the globe, uh, and more specifically in North America, that helped uh, you know real time evidence uh, to take precautionary measures as well as um, you know uh, involved with uh, providing data that is useful for many other aspects of the health and life sciences. And thirdly, having fun, uh, you know, have fun with, uh, with the job and, and, um, and balance it out. Love that. Thank you. And finally, Tim. You know, I, I, I have to say, you know, I agree with a lot of the things that were said specifically in the predictions. I think one of the things though, that if we hope to have AI actually work as an analyst, really provide value, that's a long ways off. And, and maybe there'll always be a lack of data to really train the models. But I, but I do think that there's gonna be successes that are gonna come. And one of them, um, you know, is like we all struggle with um, asset management. Latal mentioned something about happier analyst or whatever. If we actually had asset management that was accurate, ML has the possibility to do that and to do it based on the actual behavior of the device. And so it can quickly change and update and label, and then we can draw inference based on some of that behavior. And then we've been talking about user behavior analytics for so long. I actually think we have a shot at doing this now with um, you know, the right ML and algorithms behind it to look at that sustained data and patterns. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. I know I've learned so much today and I know our audience has as well. This has been incredible and I'd love to say a special thank you to all of you for sharing these perspectives with us and you know, really giving us a lot to look forward to. So thank you again. And for the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around. Thank you.